Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a woman phoning a restaurant to book a room for a party. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Shaw's Restaurant. Hi, I'd like to book one of your function rooms for a party, please. Okay, fine. How many people are you expecting for the party? Well, I'm not quite sure yet, but about 60. There are about 60 people expected, so 60 has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Shaw's Restaurant. Hi, I'd like to book one of your function rooms for a party, please. Okay, fine. How many people are you expecting for the party? Well, I'm not quite sure yet, but about 60. Fine. So you will need a big room. And what day were you thinking of? The party's for my daughter's birthday. It's her 21st. Her birthday's actually on the 17th of November, but that's a Friday. So we thought we'd have her party on the 18th, as that's a Saturday. There'll be lots of her friends there, as well as all the family. And what time would you like the room for? Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, 7.45? Not too late. Okay. And people will probably be leaving about 11. Fine. We're open until 11.30. Excellent. And what about the menu? So, do you want a sit-down meal with waiter service? Yes, not a buffet. Right. Well, there are several options including different menus at various prices. So there's the standard menu. That's 25 pounds per person. Okay. Or the celebration menu, which is three courses. It's very popular. That's 35 pounds. Okay. I think I'd rather go with that. And there's also our gold menu. That's a five-course menu at 50 pounds. No, that's definitely too expensive. Okay. Now, not all the guests eat meat. Will there be something for them? Of course. We'll make sure there's a vegetarian option for each course. Great. And do you know if any of the guests have food allergies? Anything like shellfish, for example? I'll need to check, but I do know that one of my daughter's friends is very allergic to strawberries. Even just being near them can be a problem. Okay. I'll make a note to our chef to avoid those completely. Do you have any other requests for desserts? Well, I'd like a choice if possible. And could we have cheese as well? Of course, no problem. We can provide that. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, do you have any other requests I could help with? What about after-dinner entertainment? You can book a band if you'd like live music. Actually, I think a disco would be best if you can arrange that. No problem. And I heard you might be able to put on a fireworks display. Is that possible? We aren't offering that service anymore, I'm afraid. It was just too expensive. Oh, I see. 
Now, the menu package you've chosen includes a few other nice things. Oh, like what? We'll decorate the room for you, which creates a nice party atmosphere. We can use different colors for the balloons. Silver, gold. She loves pink, but actually, I think she'd prefer flowers to balloons. So let's go for them instead, in the same color. No problem. Now, you mentioned that the party's for your daughter. We make birthday cakes if you'd like one. Okay, yes. We'll definitely want a cake. And we can put a special message on top. What would you like? Um, congratulations and then her name. That's Susie. Fine. Now, one or two of the guests are coming by train, but they stop running quite early, so they'll need a taxi to take them to the Forest Hotel after the party. Is that something you can sort out? Absolutely. Anything else? I think that's all for now. Okay. Well, just get in touch if you think of anything else. Now, if I can just take some contact details, I just need your name and phone number. I'm Maria Nelson, and my number's 07749-132-760. Excellent. We look forward to seeing you soon. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear a woman talking to a group of people who are looking round a sports and leisure centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Pause the recording for 30 seconds. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 14. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you to CityScope, our lovely modern sports and leisure facility. I've brought you up to the rooftop cafe on top of the stadium so that you can enjoy the view while I explain briefly what we have here and point out to you the major features of the site. Then we'll go round and have a look at ground level. Oh, oh that'd be interesting. I'm glad. We're extremely proud of this new facility. You see, when the project was first discussed, we expected that a multinational company would give us half our funding and the central government grant would make up most of the rest, with a smaller contribution from local business. Well, we'd got quite far into the planning stage when the multinational pulled out and both central and local government decided they couldn't afford anything. So, we ended up with a beautiful project, a small amount of sponsorship promised by local organisations, and nothing else. <laughs> we thought we'd never build it, but at the last moment, we had an amazing donation of several million pounds from a national transport company. And that got us going again, and we managed to get all the rest from local fundraising. There's hardly a street in the city that hasn't made its contribution one way or another. So there's a true sense of local ownership here. So, this is what we got. We wanted a new stadium because the 1950s football stadium is on the other side of town and is shortly due to be pulled down and built over. This site was the old airport with some playing fields on one side of it 
and a few buildings from the 1930s when the airfield first opened. So we were able to plan a new stadium with plenty of room for all the things people wanted. The playing fields have been upgraded and refenced, so they are now a set of top quality outdoor pitches for amateur football, hockey, and so on. We have both sports and other entertainments here. We want to encourage all kinds of people onto the site, and hope some of them may come to use the cinema or the cafe, and end up trying the fitness center. These are all grouped together. The cafe is in the original 1930s passenger hall, and the architects have managed to retain some of the elegant style of the building. The other buildings, like the control tower, which would have made a great feature, and the aircraft hangars, which we had hoped might house the fitness center, were unfortunately not structurally sound enough to preserve. So. Everything else is newly built. Opened in 2010. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Pause the recording for 30 seconds. Now listen and answer questions fifteen to twenty. Right now, if you'd like to gather a little closer to the window, I'll point out the various buildings. <laughs> We're at the highest point of the stadium here in the rooftop cafe, on the opposite side to the main entrance doors. On our left. You can see two buildings just beyond the end of the stadium. The closest one is the business center, used for meetings and conferences and so on, which provides a good source of revenue for the upkeep of the sports facilities. And next to the business center, the bigger building is the hotel, which is rented from us by an independent company. As you see, they are served by the perimeter road, which runs round three quarters of the site. Now, coming round to the front of the building, immediately in front of the entrance, that circular open space at the end of the road is the transport hub. From here, there are buses and a monorail link to the free car park. About ten minutes from here. But you can't see that. There's also a large, secure cycle park. Oh, and disabled parking, of course. People find it's very convenient, and it keeps the site virtually car-free. Okay, now if you look as far as you can over to the right, beyond the buildings, you can see our outdoor pitches, which I mentioned earlier. Between the pitches and the entrance is a little kind of pedestrian plaza. Are you with me? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, with the cinema in the building furthest away from us, next to the pitches. Then there's the ten-pin bowling between the cinema and the road. Near the far end of the perimeter road, and between the mini roundabout and the pitches, there's our fitness centre. With all kinds of equipment and a small pool, and changing rooms for teams using the pitches. Then, joined onto the stadium next to the entrance, is a range of small shops, which all specialise in sports equipment, clothes, shoes. They sell toys and so on as well, all that sort of thing. They seem to be doing well. As you see, the service road goes right round. But we keep the traffic and the pedestrians well apart, so it's all very relaxed round the plaza, popular with families. 
And just in front of the bowling is our lovely restaurant. You can see it from here. It's that building on the plaza between us and the bowling. It's open all day and in the evenings. There's quite a queue there at weekends. I'm pleased to say. So now you've got the layout, we can go and have a closer look at everything. Oh, oh, nice. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear two people called Chloe and Ivan talking about a business studies course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Pause the recording for 30 seconds. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Oh, hi, Ivan. Oh, hi, Chloe. I'm glad I bumped into you because I've been looking at this prospectus about courses at the university. I'm thinking of doing a business studies degree. Isn't that what you're doing? Yes, I'm about to start my third year. <laughs> I think you'd enjoy it. Is there something on the course that you're not sure about? Well, you know I've been working for a publisher for the last four years as a production assistant. That will be really valuable experience, because a lot of people go to university straight from school and don't have that kind of background. Yeah, I know. And I'm used to dealing with figures and percentages and things, but it's been a while since I've sat down and put my ideas into an essay. I was never that good at it, and I'm not sure I can do it now. But you did OK at school, hmm. so I'm sure you'll soon get into it again. I was worried about different things when I started, like if I'd be able to use all the computer programmes. But you only really need the basics. You have to do a lot of presentations, and I thought that would be hard. But we'd actually had such a lot of practice at school. It was fine. But did you find writing essays easy? Oh, it was OK, but I was hopeless at getting them in by the deadline. <laughs> and I was always late for lectures, so I had to work hard at that. And I tend to be early now. It's good that you've sorted yourself out before <laughs> you go and get a job, or you might not have it very long. <laughs> <laughs> I think the course looks really interesting. It is. And it also gave me the chance to spend six months working in a local business last year. <laughs> That's not so important for me. Unless I could go abroad to use my foreign languages. But that doesn't seem to be on offer, mm. which is a shame. What really appeals to me, though, is the idea of being assessed throughout the year. I think that's a much more productive way of learning, instead of everything being decided in an exam at the end. It's good for people like you who are hardworking all year round. You'll be spending all your time in the library. They've just expanded it, too. Mm, that's good. Well, yes and no. They've made the study area bigger, but it means they've taken some of the magazines and periodicals away. Mm. So I think it was better as it was. The university is expanding all the time, and there are lots of new courses coming next year. 
Well, that's great news, isn't it? It means the college will have a better reputation, as more people will hear about it. So that's good for us.、Hmm. I agree, but they really need to add more lecture rooms, as we often have lectures in tiny rooms. Well, you obviously think overall it's a good place to do a degree. I should probably go and have a look round. Well, it's holidays now, and there's not much going on there. Oh. So it's probably not worth going in now. But you could email my tutor. I know he'd be happy to answer any questions. I can give you his email address. <laughs> I looked at quite a lot of other universities and read loads of prospectuses, but I thought this one was the best. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Pause the recording for thirty seconds. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. I was a bit unsure about all the different subjects you can choose on this course. Well, I can tell you a bit about them. There are some subjects you have to do, and some that you can choose.、Mm -hmm. The most interesting course I've done is public relations. From what I've read, it doesn't look very demanding. Some of it is really just common sense, <laughs> but it will be really useful if you want to go into marketing or advertising. That's true, but I need to find out a bit more about it first before I decide、mm. if it will really help me. It's difficult to tell from the prospectus. But you are interested in marketing. Oh、well, yes. Well, you can choose a marketing course. I wasn't very impressed with that course actually. The tutor didn't make it very interesting. <laughs> It's good to put on your CV that you've done a marketing course, though. So that would be a definite for me, and maybe I'd get a different tutor.、Hmm. What other courses did you choose? I'm doing taxation, as I was thinking of training to be an accountant, but I'm not sure now. Oh, that will be a good option for me, because I enjoy working with figures. Although I don't want to be an accountant, it'll be good to have an understanding of taxation, especially if I ever run my own business. Then there's the most popular course, which is human resources, and a lot of people seem to get jobs in that field.、Mm, my friend works in human resources, and she's really good at it. But I don't think I've got the right personality, so I'd give that one a miss. <laughs> I'm more interested in how businesses actually work, the structure. That's a compulsory course, the structure of business. Oh, but you might find information systems helpful. Is that kind of computer programs? Some of it is, but also databases, project management, and other things. Oh, this sounds useful, but I'll have to look at some of the other possibilities first.、Mm. You know, Ivan, this course sounds as though it would suit me. I'm going to apply. <laughs> Great. If there's anything else you want to ask me, you've got my number. <laughs> Thanks. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear a talk by a meteorologist about weather forecasting. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Pause the recording for one minute.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I work for the National Weather Service and as part of your course on weather patterns, I've been asked to talk to you about how we predict the weather. We're so used to switching on our TVs and getting an up-to-date weather forecast at any time of day or night that we probably forget that this level of sophistication has only been achieved in the last few decades and weather forecasting is actually an ancient art. So I want to start by looking back into history. The earliest weather forecasts appeared in the 1500s in almanacs, which were lists of information produced every year. Their predictions relied heavily on making links between the weather and where the planets were in the sky on certain days. In addition, predictions were often based on information, like if the fourth night after a new moon was clear, good weather was expected to follow. But once basic weather instruments were invented, things slowly started to change. In the mid-15th century, a man called Nicholas Cusa, a German mathematician, designed a hygrometer which told people how much humidity there was in the air. To do this, Cusa put some sheep's wool on a set of scales and then monitored the change in the wool's weight according to the air conditions. A piece of equipment we all know and use is the thermometer. Changes in temperature couldn't really be measured until the Italian Galileo Galilei invented his thermometer in 1593. It wasn't like a modern-day thermometer because it had water inside it instead of mercury. In fact, it wasn't until 1714 that Gabriel Fahrenheit invented the first mercury thermometer. In 1643, another Italian, called Evangelista Torricelli, invented the first barometer, which measured atmospheric pressure. This was another big step forward in more accurate weather predicting. As time went on, during the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, all these meteorological instruments were improved and developed, and people in different countries began to record measurements relating to their local weather. However, in those days it was very difficult to send records from one part of the world to another so it wasn't possible for them to share their information until the electric telegraph became more widespread. This meant that weather observations could be sent on a regular basis to and from different countries. By the 1860s, therefore, weather forecasts were becoming more common and accurate because they were based on observations taken at the same time over a wide area. In 1863, France started publishing weather maps each day. This hadn't been done before, and other nations soon followed. So that was the start of national weather forecasting. And I'll now tell you how we at the National Weather Centre get the information we need to produce a forecast. Even today... One of the most important methods we use is observations, which tell us what the weather is doing right now. Observation reports are sent automatically from equipment at a number of weather stations in different parts of the country. They are nearly all based at airports, although a few are in urban centres. The equipment senses temperature, humidity, pressure and wind speed direction. Meteorologists also rely really heavily on satellites, which send images to our computer screens. What we see on our screens is bright colours. Orange represents dry air, and bright blue shows moisture levels in the atmosphere. The satellites are located 22,000 miles above the surface of the Earth, and it's amazing that despite that distance it's possible for us to make out an individual cloud and follow it as it moves across the landscape. 
In addition to collecting data from the ground, we need to know what's happening in the upper levels of the atmosphere. So a couple of times a day, from many sites across the country, we send radio sondes into the air. A radio sonde is a box containing a package of equipment and it hangs from a balloon which is filled with gas. Data is transmitted back to the weather station. Finally, radar. This was first used over 150 years ago and still is. New advances are being made all the time and it is one method for detecting and monitoring the progress of hurricanes. Crucial information is shown by different colours representing speed and direction. Radar is also used by aircraft, of course. All this information from different sources is put into computer models, which are like massive computer programs. Sometimes they all give us the same story, and sometimes we have to use our own experience to decide which is showing the most accurate forecast, which we then pass on to you. So, I hope next time you watch the weather forecast, you'll think about how we meteorologists spend our time. And maybe I've persuaded some of you to study meteorology in more depth. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.